Hello everyone, I am Aisha and I'll be teaching you all about DVD therapy and the videos I'll be making will be specially for the psychologist who wants to learn the modalities like DBT, CPT, MBT from A to Z uh, to treat the patients like uh, what is it, how to do it, on which model it is based, how to set the target hierarchy for the therapy <clears throat> and how to do the uh, conceptualizations and interventions in detail along with the clinical examples. Yes, let's move ahead. So in the first chapter I'll be teaching you what is DBT, the main differences between uh, DBT and CBT therapy. This is the cognitive behavior therapy, what uh, disorders the DBT treat, the biosocial theory in DBT and the classical and apparent conditioning in DBT. So yes, let's move ahead. So, so yes, we discussed the contents of chapter one in the previous slide. So in chapter two, we will be discussing about how to select and define the problem behaviors. Uh, we will be making target hierarchy along with the patient. In the target hierarchy, we will be focusing on the three main goals. Um, the first one will be like life-threatening behaviors. Uh, what I meant by life-threatening behaviors is like a suicidal, uh, suicidal behaviors, the suicidal attempts, the homicidal behaviors, the overdosing. Um, like a cutting of forearms, arms, vomiting to cause bleeding, burning forearm arms, and uh, yeah, this was this will we will cover these these main goals in the life-threatening behaviors. The second goal we will set is therapy interfering behaviors. In therapy interfering behaviors, we will be setting goals related to like missing therapy appointments, refusing to practice suggested skills, uh, not concentrating in the therapy sessions if there are such kind of problems uh, in dealing with the client. So in third one, we'll be discussing about uh, vomiting, binging, restriction food to fewer than uh, 1200 calories a day. So these are, you know, a quality of life interfering behaviors. So these three main goals will be setting in the target hierarchy. Diary card, what is the diary card? Uh, the diary card, it's given to the patient to record their target behaviors along with the skills which we will be teaching them and how they will utilize their skills to control those target behaviors. Conceptualization, what is conceptualization? Conceptualization is actually a framework that is used to understand the patient and his current problems and um, to inform about the treatment and the intervention techniques and it basically serves as a foundation to assess patient change and progress. So yes, let's move ahead. So in chapter three, we will be uh, talking about the behavior chain analysis. This is basically the behavior conceptualization. In this uh, conceptualization, we will be selecting one target from the target hierarchy, which we made before. And then uh, we will look at the function of that target and the vulnerability factors and the types of links and links in chain. So don't worry, I'll be teaching you this in detail when I'll be uploading more videos on each of the chapters. And in chapter 4, we will be generating the solution. We will evaluate the solutions and we will implement the solutions. So yes, let's move ahead. So in chapter 5, I'll be teaching you uh, about the skills how to strengthen the skills, how to generalize the skills and uh, sorry I wrote by mistake two times. So in skills training I'll be teaching you about the distress tolerance skills, the emotional regulation skills, um, the mindfulness skills, the interpersonal effectiveness skills and the reality acceptance skills 
and later on I'll be teaching you some cognitive skills that will help you to change the unhelpful thoughts into helpful ones. So yes, let's move ahead. So yes, in chapter 6, I'll be teaching you the about stimulus control and the exposure, how decrease, increase, change, control, and modifying some kind of stimuli can help you to overcome some problems, exposure as well. So yes, let's move ahead. So in chapter 7, I'll be teaching you how to do the cognitive modification, how to change the negative thoughts into the helpful ones and uh, the learning exercises like the TCR, the thought change record, the A, B, C, D, E and how to label your thoughts and how to overcome that. In chapter 8, I'll be teaching you about the contingency management and what is it the procedure it uh, involves is intentionally modifying the behaviors by managing the consequences of the behaviors and uh, this procedure it requires a therapist to strate strategically utilize the principles of normal learning processes to maximize clients motivation to engage in s skillful behavior and to stop the problematic behaviors so yes let's move ahead So yes, what's DBT? DBT is actually a type of talking therapy that is designed specially for people who experience very strong emotions. Um, it is actually a modified type of cognitive behavior therapy and its main goal are to teach people how to live in the moment and to develop the healthy ways to cope with the stress. Um, yeah, also to regulate their emotions and to improve their relationship with others. Beside this, dialectic means uh, trying to understand how two different things that seem opposite could be true. For example, accepting yourself and changing your behavior might feel contradictory, but DBT, it actually teaches you that it's possible for you to achieve both these goals together. So yes, let's move ahead. So yes, what does DBT treat? DBT treats the self-harming behaviors, the suicidal attempts, the borderline personality disorder, the eating disorders such as anorexia nervosa, the bulimia nervosa, offending behaviors, drug and alcohol problems. DBT was actually uh, developed to treat chronically suicidal individuals that were diagnosed with the borderline personality disorders. And uh, now it is recognized as the gold standard psychological treatment for the population. In addition, research has shown that it is effective in treating a wide range of other disorders such as substance dependence, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, eating disorders. DBT therapists, uh, what they do is actually they accept client as they are while also acknowledging that they do change to reach their goals. Apart from this, in DBT, the skills and the strategies taught are uh, composed of four skills modules, which includes two sets of accepted oriented skills that in mindfulness and distress tolerance and two sets of change oriented skills that includes emotional dysregulation skills and interpersonal effectiveness skills so yes let's move ahead so what is the difference between uh, dbt and cbt CBT actually seeks to give patient the ability to recognize when their thoughts might become troublesome and gives them the technique to redirect those thoughts. DBT actually helps patient to find ways to accept themselves, feel safe and manage their emotions to help regulate potentially destructive or harmful behaviors. 
Also, one more difference is there is CBD. It's actually our short-term DBT. It, uh, it's a long-term therapy. It requires uh, a duration like a one year with the patient. So yes, let's move ahead. So DBT, it's basically based on classical conditioning. And what is classical conditioning? Classical conditioning is actually a learning process that occurs when two stimuli are repeatedly paired. For example, as you can see in this uh, slide, a client attacked an ally, which is an unconditioned stimulus, experienced the anxiety whenever she sees alleyways or dark narrow streets and avoid walking in part of her town with these features. So in this example, as you can see, the pairing of conditioned stimulus, the LA, with the unconditioned stimulus response, panic, is overt. And uh, one more uh, conditioning is there. It's called aversive conditioning. So what I mean by aversive conditioning is, it's actually a process by which the unpleasant stimulus is paired with the undesirable behavior for example um, a person who is undergoing an aversive conditioning might want to stop smoking so what is done in that uh, condition in that condition to stop smoking that person is given an electric shock whenever he sees the image of the a cigarette so the goal of this conditioning process is to make the individual associate the stimulus with the unpleasant or uncomfortable sensation. Apart from that, DBT also applies the conditioning, the classical conditioning to other emotions and to responses other than avoidance. So yes, let's move ahead. Feelings and behavior, they arise in response to stimuli that is classical conditioning and are reinforced or punished by consequences that is apparent conditioning. Skinner, he actually first defined the idea of apparent conditioning. He described that the interaction of people and animal with their environment consists of three factors that are the incident, the behavior and the consequences. So what is incident? These are actually the trig triggering or prompting event or circumstances that lead to response. Behavior, what is it? The response to the incident is behavior we are interested in. So the consequences, it has the four quadrants, negative reinforcement, the positive reinforcement, positive punishment, and negative punishment. So let's see what is negative reinforcement. The removal of something negative that results in behavior being maintained or increased. For example, if a girl takes out an umbrella and he, she uses it when it starts to rain, it prevents her from getting wet. So why this negative reinforcement is done? It basically teaches us to behave in a manner that helps us to get rid of unhelpful or nasty responses this negative reinforcement it actually works as a lesson so let's talk about the positive reinforcement what is positive reinforcement it is actually an introduction of desirable or pleasant stimulus after behavior such as reward for example if uh, if a parent says to uh, his child that if you uh, get full marks in a test, I'll give you a chocolate. So this is an example of positive reinforcement. Now let's talk about positive punishment and negative punishment. Positive punishment, what is it? The addition of something that results in decreasing unwanted behaviors. For example, adding more chores to the list of your child when they neglect their responsibilities. Negative re punishment, what is it? The removal of something positive <clears throat> that results in decreasing behavior. For example, if there is a person who who has a ha habit of speeding, so if their license is suspended, it would be an example of negative punishment. So we will talk these quadrants in detail, how we can use that 
in the clinical examples uh, to help the patient. So yes, let's move. Okay, so what is biosocial theory? Biosocial theory is a theory in uh, behavioral and so social science that describes personality disorder and mental illness and disabilities as biologically determined personality traits reacting to environmental stimuli. Okay, so let me explain you. The researches on brain, they actually shows that some people, they, uh, they tend to experience things more intensely and as a result more reactive to events than other people this is actually something that is a part of pers person's genes and it's a product of their early life experience either way the person has higher degree of sensitivity to emotions so that they are activated more easily and heightened in their response and slower to come back down once activated it is actually important to know that it's, it is just not the person reacting more intensely that could be sound like blaming. It is that their experience is more intense for all the events, both pleasant and unpleasant. Dr. Linneman, he refers this as lacking an emotional skin and likened to burn the victim who experienced pain at the slightest touch. Actually, uh, emotional sensitivity, it's not a problem in itself. In fact, it has many benefits such as increased intensity of love, passion, empathy and connection. However, when a person does not know how to take care of their sensitivity, they may learn to dull the pain through escaping or avoiding emotions. This can lead to extreme behaviors that have their own consequences as well as byproduct of maintaining the belief that the person cannot tolerate and cope with the intense emotion. So yes, this is the idea behind biosocial theory. I'll explain you this in... Um, uh, diagram as well I have so let's move ahead so what is the role of invalidation and validation okay so when a person experience emotions that are more intense than those around them they often feel different from others and that can leave them feeling disconnected they may receive a range of messages from others that they should tone down their emotions such as being told that they are too emotional or they are too sensitive. They may then experience a sense of being rejected, not understood or punished for their emotional intensity. Over the time, the person starts to believe that the message that their emotions should not be as they are or that, hey, you are overreacting, they, they may learn that uh, to distrust their own emotional experience and start to reject or punish themselves for their emotional experience. Dr. Lennon says that you cannot ride and have control of horse without being on the horse. So if you reject your emotional experience, it is hard to learn how to manage it. This brings this brings us to another dialectic in DBT. In order to manage or change our response to our emotion, we must first accept that this is the experience we are having. And later on, when we are having session with the client, we teach them one skill that is called radical acceptance. And we are talking about this acceptance of emotions in that. So yes, let's move. Okay, so people who experience very strong, intense emotions, they need some specialized skills to manage their emotions as compared to people who don't experience that much of intense emotion. Let me explain you by example. For example, um, one race car motor, when everyone around you is driving a standard car, most people learn how to drive in an ordinary car. And so the advice most people get about driving relates to this. However, to drive a Formula 1 car, you need more specialized skills. Otherwise, you are going to carry around feeling out of control, crashing. Okay, let me give you one more example. 
most people can get on horse do a few laps around the paddock or even a trial ride without too much trouble however it takes a specialist skills to ride a thoroughbred race horse what's more and this is very important to learn how to drive a formula one car or ride a thoroughbred takes time and practice similarly learning to emotions that are more sensitive to outside world requires learning and practicing different skills so yes let's move ahead this was the idea behind the biosocial theory that some people they are born with the emotional sensitivity and it's in their genes and then when they come in an environment that are invalidating to their emotions they experience the pervasive emotional dysregulation so yes this was the idea behind the biosocial theory i hope you like my videos and it's very informative and that conclude the presentation i want to thank everybody for taking out time for listening and i wish everyone well thank you so much and have a wonderful day and like and subscribe my channel to see more informative video and i'll be uploading uh following chapters very soon to train you on dbt okay take care bye bye